Today we are going to continue to talk about the issue of freedom, the issue of deliverance. Um, I heard a story of a, it's a parable of an angel coming to one guy who had a neighbor and he was very envious of his neighbor. He always wanted and wished his neighbor something bad. And so an angel comes to him and he says, I'm going to give you an offer. He says, whatever I give you, whatever you ask for, I will give to you. But there is one trick. Your neighbor will have double of that. So if you ask for a house, your neighbor will have two. And now he's envious and he doesn't like that guy. He said, if you ask for a car, your neighbor will have two. Now imagine you're in that dilemma. You have somebody you completely dislike. And God comes and he says, whatever you ask, your enemy gets double of that. What would you ask for? So, some of you are like, hmm, that's interesting. Don't worry, God won't ask you that question. Don't waste your brain and energy right now. So, but this man answered the following. He says, I, I have an answer. He says, I want you to remove one eye. <laughs> so that the enemy, his friend, his neighbor, will have two of his eyes removed. That's revenge. That's hate. Bitterness. When I was younger and I was in about third grade, I was walking. My parents sent me to buy bread and as an obedient child, I went to do my chores. And so I was going, I brought bread and I was walking back home and these, these thugs from my school, they intercepted me and they asked me what I was doing and I said, I'm carrying bread. So they took my bread. My parents actually don't think that they know the story. They took the bread, they put it aside and both of these guys start punching me. And they punched me everywhere. They, I was really bruised up and hurt. And, and after that, uh, I wasn't bleeding or anything, but I was in, in big pain. And I couldn't defend myself. And so I took the bread, walked home. And next day I came to school. And this is what I discovered my leadership abilities. I went and I hired a gang <laughs> for 50 cents. <laughs> I was a Christian, but I didn't act like a Christian at the time. I still cannot think that I actually did that. I went and hired him. I remember it was 50 cents. It was so cheap. I showed him the guy. And after school, the guy was walking. He was without his thugs. And so they intercepted him. And they beat him so bad. <laughs> while I stood and watched. <laughs> I'm in third grade. And uh, this guy never touched me again. <laughs> when I was leaving to America, actually, the gang came to me and they said... If you give, pay us more, we can beat him more as a gift for your departure to America. And I said, no, 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 it's fine. Let him, let him stay here at this blessed Ukraine and I'm going to go to America. Revenge, hate, these are feelings that we all are very accustomed with because they are human feelings. They're human natural response to betrayal, hurt. This is the natural response being rejected, being backstabbed, being cheated on, being abused, God forbid, being sexually abused, verbally, violently or physically abused. The statistic says that 30% of kids will be born to single parent homes. 72% of youth of people who are young who are murderers grow up without dads. 71% of school dropouts also grew up in the fatherless home. 90% of homeless and runaway kids are in from fatherless homes. Abuse of kids has increased 137% since, since 1980. Physical abuse has increased 84% since 1980. Abuse, sexual abuse has increased 350% since 1980. One out of five girls will be raped. One out of 20 boys will be also a victim of sexual abuse. Only 30% is ever reported to the authorities. We live in a world that is broken. We live in a world where someone's decision affects you. God gave us a free choice. Well, with that free choice comes a responsibility. Which means that if on Friday night I get drunk and I get behind the wheel, my free choice affects you. And if I choose to live righteous and if I choose to live holy, my free choice will also affect you. 
and many times we end up in a crossfire between other people's free choices when a, a, a person you know maybe gets pregnant and gives up on the child and you know that's, that's that's great in the sense that the child at least has a chance to be in someone else's home but then the child grows up and has its, its challenges it has its insecurities maybe two parents have reconcilable differences and they decided to separate and guess who suffers like they say when elephants fight grass suffers maybe a relative or some kind of a friend you know started to touch you inappropriately and and guess what happens their choice became your pain and many times we find ourselves in those kind of situations matter of god statistics has and studies have been done how much these things affect our development our self-esteem our ability to trust people our ability to perform actually even lowers our iq kills our brain cells and introduces and draws sicknesses at the rate that is so fast you know i heard of this uh, story in spain where one father had a son who left his house and the son was rebellious and he left the house and uh, he wasn't heard from and the father was looking for his son and looking for his son and without an avail he couldn't find his son and decided to put an ad in the newspaper and he said dear Pablo he said this is your father I have forgiven you for everything you've done please come back home I love you tomorrow at noon I'm waiting for you at post office next day he came at noon and there was 800 Pablos waiting for the father in one prison that was incarcerated had men to tell about 2,000 men on the father's day they brought cards to give to the men to send to their fathers to congratulate them with the father's day and not one man picked up the card and when the person there asked why are you not picking up the card you hate your father and all together two thousand men replied we don't know their name that's the culture and the generation we're living in while you're making your decisions to satisfy your lusts and desires while you are reacting out of the pain that was given to you you're also transmitting pain to another generation and we're going to deal with that today you may say how does that relate to spiritual world how does that relate to demons and curses it does relate because demons are like sharks sharks smell blood sharks are attracted to blood when you go bleeding in an ocean that has sharks it's over the world you're living in is an ocean demons are sharks and when you are hurting and these hurts are not taken care of these hurts are turned into grudges anger and when these hurts are turned into unforgiveness and offense when these hurts turn inward and you become the person that you despised other people for at that very moment there are sharks there are demons that begin to haunt your life and they begin to possess you slowly but surely Bob Larson who is responsible for casting out of 30,000 documented exorcisms in his lifetime 30,000 documented exorcisms one of the foremost known authorities when it comes to exorcisms and deliverance in I believe even in the world he says in the other countries of the world the main open door for demons in Africa in Asia even in Russia in Ukraine in Mexico in other countries he says it's usually witchcraft he says in America the main 80 something percent of people who have demons in their life in America is through one door abuse unresolved hurt and resentment that draws eventually other demons that draws eventually other evil spirits that come in and begin to torture a person's life a few weeks ago when I talked about how to keep the demons out and we mentioned the idea of we need to be disciplined we've mentioned that we also need to clean up our life we mentioned that we have to be filled with Holy Spirit but today I'm going to bring one more thing to keep the demons out and to get demons out and that is to deal with the issue of our pain and to deal with the issue of our rejection and it might seem for a moment like it's a girl's message it's to deal with a little bit with the emotions um, but all the brothers I want you to hang in also I think I believe this is very important and I believe that we all are going to benefit from this in Jesus name can somebody say amen, amen. 
If you have your Bible we will go together to gospel of uh, to the book of Acts actually chapter 8 verse 22 and verse 23. Repent therefore of his of your wickedness and pray God pray to God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you for I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity now let me give you the background on the story of book chapter 8 uh, book of Acts chapter 8 there was a guy named Simon he was a sorcerer he was uh, using his skills combined with witchcraft to manipulate control people and therefore he made money and Philip comes into his city named Samaria and Philip preaches the gospel, heals the sick, casts out demons and everyone follows Philip and they stop following Simon. Simon loses his business and Simon sees the great power of God. Simon puts all of his sorcery, puts all of that stuff aside, goes to Philip, I'm all yours. I want to get saved. I want to get baptized. Simon and Philip's miracle catch gets baptized. They produce a video, upload it to Facebook, YouTube and Vimeo and Simon follows Philip's ministry until one day Peter comes and Peter begins to pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues and people start speaking in tongues left and right and Simon seeing that he says dude that is a cool trick he comes to Peter and he says Peter here's some money I withdrew from my retirement 401k and so could you give me some of that power the tricks that you got you know under your sleeve so I can do exactly the same thing go touch people and they pow pow and they start speaking in tongues and Peter could have easily, you know, he knew, he could have said, well, Simon, uh, this is a little bit different than what you're used to. But Holy Spirit gives him an insight into Simon's life. And this is what he says. He says, Simon, he says, I see you poisoned with bitterness and bound by iniquity. Simon, you get baptized. You came to the altar. But Simon, you are still bound by sin. And that cause for that sin that you are bound by is not actually the sin it's the bitterness that empowers the sin you're fighting with you got rid of the witchcraft but you didn't get rid of the, the bondage the bondage is still there though the witchcraft is over but the bondage is there and the bondage has a hold on your life because the bitterness has a hold on your heart I'm going to share with you three simple thoughts the first one if you have the right if you hold on to bitterness, if you have the right to hold on to bitterness, Satan has the right to hold you in bondage. If you say, I have the right to be bitter. I have the right to be mad of what they've done, of what, you know, they didn't do. I have a right. You do. So is Satan. If you have a right to be bitter, Satan has a right to keep you in bondage. You may have a right, you may have a reason, but you must lay that right down so that you can strip the devil from his right to keep you in bondage. Somebody say amen. You got to lay that right down. When we get betrayed, when we get rejected at a young age, or maybe we have an absence of the father or mother in our life, or maybe we get abused, or if you have in that household where your parents want you to really be like your neighbor's kid and they think that by comparing you every single day is going to somehow motivate you to become better they don't mean to compare you they just want to motivate you because nothing else motivates you and you live with that comparison and after a while you know it begins to hurt you begins to you're not good enough and it begins to affect your life and when you begin to develop that that offense when you begin to develop that bitterness when you begin to allow that pain to come and settle in and you hold on to that instead of letting it go and saying God this hurts God this is not fair God what did I do to deserve this but God I refuse to be mad I refuse to hold on to that I refuse to hold on to that pain I refuse to punish somebody I refuse to live my life trying to make them pay I refuse to live my life that I surrender it to you something happens. Satan at that moment, the hold that he had on you, the oil begins to flow on you and you become slicky. He can hold you. You begin to move out and he begins to hold you and you snap out because he doesn't have a grip. He can't have a grip because the oil of the Holy Spirit is being released on you. The moment you release people. 
The moment you release people from the prison that they have caused, put themselves into because of what they've done to you or left undone to you, the Holy Spirit releases oil and Satan can no longer hold you. See the problem many times that happens is that Satan holds us with sins, bondages, alcohol, pornography, cheating, lying. It could be a self-destructive behavior. It could be a reckless behavior. It could be other bondages that Satan holds us with. But the power for him is actually what we hold on to. And so what we do is we keep praying, Satan get your hands off of me. And God is saying get your hands off of stuff that belongs to him. Unforgiveness is drinking a rat poison, hoping for a rat to die from it. A rat will not die when you drink that poison. The person who drinks it dies. When you and I take the poison of the devil and then hope for it not to kill us but to kill someone else, it empowers Satan even more. I've seen this more and more as I meet with people. As I even look at my own heart sometimes and there is, you know how some people you have and by default you have this automatic response on them, either good or bad. Whatever they do, it's the same response. And you catch yourself, you're like, wait, they were not that bad. Why did I jump on them again? Until you sit down and you begin to decode yourself and you ask the Holy Spirit to begin to guide you and you remember the event where they treated you the bad and you still didn't fully resolve that and though they moved on, they asked for forgiveness, everything changed, you're still treating them from the event that happened five years ago that you didn't fully let go and therefore Satan can control you in your behavior because you control the bitterness, he controls the behavior. You want his hand to be loose from the behavior, God says, loose this. You say, but that's not fair. And that's when Satan says, well, then that's not fair for me to be loose from you. I remember ministering with my wife to a young lady who came to our house. And she began to confess some of the things that, uh, that she was going through and how, how she was abused. And uh, this was a Russian young lady from another city, doesn't come to our church and none of you here know her and she began to mention how certain people took uh, physically they abused her and and she told other people nobody believed her and then after that she said I didn't know what to deal with this she said it destroyed my self-esteem my self-worth like I didn't I begin to hate men and I begin to live with passion to destroy men he said, I quickly moved out of my parents' house. Like, I'm a rebellious kid. I am, a, I am the prodigal. He says, but nobody knows what drives and motivates that behavior. She recklessly began to sleep with men, to hurt men. Especially with married men. At that moment that she was in the house, she was dating a married man. For a few years. Only for one reason. To hurt. He said, I find no pleasure. I don't even like him. A behavior controlled by Satan. Somebody let themselves go to such a low standard. Why? Because when you hold on to this and you don't deal with this, you allow Satan to hold on to that. And you can scream and yell and rebuke that. But if you don't let go of this, he doesn't let go of that. Is anybody with me? We ministered to her. She repented. She forgave that person. She broke up the relationship. She actually moved out of this town, moved back home. And reconcile with her family. When you disconnect the root, you can only then attack the fruit. Many times the fruit, our addictions and our behaviors that we're fighting with, either whether it's alcohol or whether it's abusive relationships, jumping from one relationship to another, all of these many times, not always, but many times bound by iniquity is a result of being poisoned by bitterness. When you are poisoned by bitterness, you live out of that event instead of living out of the grace and the mercy that God has for you. Don't attack the behavior. Look for the cause. On Sunday, 
I, I started a fireplace in my house and I love fire and I love fireplace and so as, as the fireplace got really hot and the fire was burning really hot in the fireplace there's this a, there's a fan and I didn't really fully understand the purpose of that fan I thought it was the fan is just there to blow, blow the heat out of the fireplace into the living room so I turned off the fan because the house was already hot and then my smoke detector went off the first smoke detector went off and so I turned it down it went off again about five times and so I got so mad that I went and asked my dad how could I turn off the electricity in my house to kill the smoke detector I removed all the batteries and they kept going off and, and so I went in and I found where I turned off completely three rooms I turned off all the electricity in three rooms just to turn off the smoke detectors because that that noise annoyed me my father he drove by the, uh, the the streets and he came to my house and he said why is the fan not on and I said well I don't like the too much heat from the fireplace I just like to watch the fire in the fireplace he says that fan is to cool down the fireplace otherwise that heat that you cannot even smell and see begins to fill the house your house actually can get on fire and that's why the smoke detectors went off so here I am <laughs> killing a smoke detector <laughs> instead of solving the problem I know none of you have ever done that how many of you those, those of you who are ladies, you got a first car and then you saw a light on the dashboard. Usually our first thought is not to go to a mechanic. Can you fix it? No, can you remove the light? <laughs> if you light that your gas tank is empty and you don't have gas and, and instead of going to a gas station, you're going to a mechanic and he says, this light annoys me. Can you just remove it? And that's how many times we treat it. When we have an addiction or a bondage, we run to fix the behavior. And God says, I want you to look deeper into what empowers that behavior. <clears throat> Number two, don't blame God for what Satan did. So the first one is that we don't deal just with the behavior. We look at our heart. Where is something that allows Satan to have that control? What is that unforgiveness that we need to let go of? What is that thing that we need to deal with? The second thing is that we must not blame God for what Satan is responsible for. And I understand what I'm saying this. There are people here today who maybe you're asking the questions, where was God when that happened? Maybe you were born with certain disability or maybe you had an accident that happened to you and you're in your mind you're like God could have prevented that. He could have stopped that. Or maybe somebody's decisions affected you. You know it is foolish to blame God for the damages that happen on the earth when God gave us this earth and the responsibility over this earth. It's like you blaming the secretary of transportation over the accident on the highway 182. He's not responsible. He gave the rules, he paved it and it's our responsibility to drive according to those rules and laws and therefore we can be safe. When we break those rules, we can't blame it on him. But what Satan likes to do is this, is that when an unfortunate situation happened, maybe even something that quote unquote God could have prevented, God could have stopped it, we think in our mind. And what we do is we develop hate and bitterness not only toward people and situations we develop bitterness toward God why did he allow me to be born like this why did he allow that person to do this to me why did he allow this and that and the more you spend fostering anger against God guess what happens at this moment you are shutting down your only hope that not only can change you but use that mess for your good and slap the devil's face when we believe a lie about God we are like Pilate and Pharisees who fabricate truth about Jesus and they say Jesus is bad Jesus is this and we tie Jesus's hands and while Jesus's hands were tied on the other side Barabbas who was a robber a murderer and a thief <laughs> something like the Bible says about Satan John 10 10 came to steal, kill and destroy. Barabbas is just like Satan and as Jesus is being bound, accused of something he is not, Barabbas who is a mess is being released 
Anytime there is a situation in your life you don't understand. Anytime there is a situation in your life and Satan poisons you against God. At that moment he does it for one purpose. He can release demons against your life. Untie Jesus. Untie his hands. Remove the handcuff from God and you will see God will move on your behalf. He will not only heal and restore you. He will not only restore you, but you will recognize God was never responsible for your pain. God never caused any pain. God did not create that mess. You will understand God was there all the way long trying to protect you, guard you, heal you, restore you, redeem you and he will use that for your good. In a way you will look back and you say this is this is unbelievable. Only God is able to do that. Every problem you face is like a knife. You can take it by the blade, hold it up to God and scream and yell why and when and why and when and you'll bleed to death. If you take it by the handle and you say God I don't understand it hurts but I trust you. I don't understand it hurts but I know that you love me and I know you will never do anything against me and I reject every lie of the devil because I know the truth. I look at the cross and I see how much you loved me. I don't look at the accident. I don't look at my mom passing away. I don't look at that problem. I don't look at that to see how much you love me. I look at the cross to see how much you love me and I tell the devil shut up. My God is on my side. My feelings do not determine his presence. His word determines his presence and the scars in the Savior's hands. That's what tells me Jesus is for me and he loves me. And let me say respectfully those of you who say where was God? In the same place he was when his son was dying for your sin. On his throne. Where was God? When that happened? In the same place he was when his son was dying for your rebellion. God never stopped loving you. God never stopped caring for you. Satan will use your situation to make you poisoned against God so he can release his demons. If you get mad at God, you lose your only chance of ever being rescued from that situation. You become bitter, you become angry and Satan becomes the winner. Number three, to forgive is to set the prisoner free and most of you know this quote and discover that the prisoner was you. Forgiving other people. To forgive is to set the prisoner free and to discover the prisoner was you. In Matthew chapter 18 verse 34 says the following. And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he would pay all that was due to him. In Matthew chapter 18 Jesus tells a story about a king who had a servant and the servant owed him 10,000 talents. Now when you say talents you're like man I like a talent 10,000 a lot great and we don't understand what 10,000 talents is. I'm going to tell you in historians and scholars they did a study and they tried to calculate in consistency with our wages today. 10,000 talents is symbolic of 200,000 years worth of labor. Now I don't know what did that servant do to take 200,000 years worth of labor from his master. I don't know if he burned his palaces. I don't know if he took his checking book and just went and I don't know. What, did, what can you do to be able to owe somebody 200,000 years of labor? I don't know. But definitely a lot of damage, financial damage he did to the king. And the servant comes to the king and says this which is ridiculous. He says, be patient with me. I will pay you back. <laughs> really? What do you believe in karma or what? How are you going to pay it back? You're only going to live 70, 80 years and it's going to take you 200,000 years. He says, be patient with me. So this guy is completely crazy. And the king looks at that and this is very interesting. The king does not get mad. He gets compassionate. He says forgives him. The man gets out and says well this is awesome. 
no payments the interest didn't get reduced you know it wasn't like hey no you're not gonna pay for a year and then no completely free debt 200,000 years of work the damage it left on the king he's willing to recompensate it by his own work and this man leaves and finds a man who owes him a hundred denarii a hundred denarii is worth of four months of labor he finds a man so just got forgiven 200,000 years of labor finds a man who owes him four months of labor the Bible says took him by the throat and starts choking him and says pay me back and the man says of course give me time and the guy wants to get the payment back and locks him up in prison how do you expect a man to pay you back if you put him in prison ask the guy when the king heard that the bible says listen very carefully the king got angry That's interesting he wasn't angry when the guy owed him something he couldn't pay he was angry when the guy didn't forgive someone of a lesser crime and he was forgiven you know what really angers God not your sin it's how you react to other people's sin you think many times what we think is God is angry at me because I've fallen yes if you forgive if you come broken God will God will have compassion if you come and say God I messed it up God will have compassion but when God really gets angry is when someone else sins against you and you do not offer the same thing you've been offered to yourself maybe today you feel like what they've done is so big but it never compares to 200,000 years of labor that you and I have done to God and we must choose to forgive when you forgive you become free forgiveness does not let the other person off the hook it lets you off the hook forgiveness does not change the past it changes your future forgiveness it's not fair but it positions you for favor forgiveness they don't deserve it but you deserve to have peace they don't deserve it but you deserve to be free forgiveness you cannot wait until they ask for it that's giving them too much power for too long people could say well when they change I'll forgive them that's giving them too much power forgiveness is when you get bitter and when you're mad the lie of the enemy is I'm punishing them most of them don't even know you they hurt you they're sleeping you're not punishing nobody but yourself you're hurting no one but yourself and when you are offering forgiveness what you are doing at that moment is you are setting a captive free and the captive my friend is you the captive is you I heard a story of a little boy he was nine years of age when a burglar came into their house and wanted to take all the jewelry and this guy was completely demon possessed he killed his mother right in front of him and then this burglar took a knife and stabbed that nine-year-old boy 39 times thinking the boy is dead left the ambulance came in and they found out that the boy went unconscious because of the pain shock but he was still alive when he finally got recovered and he came back to his feet he grew up and he had a really 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 hard time reconciling and forgiving that man who took his mother the only person and who gave him so many attacks with a knife but as he began to get closer to the Lord and he stopped comparing what the man did to him but start comparing what he did to the Savior and how not just forgave Savior forgave but Savior says I forgive and I give you the Holy Spirit and I take you to heaven with me and I love you not just I forgive and you stay in prison and I don't want to see you and when he saw that love from a man 
that couldn't gain anything by forgiving us Jesus Christ and he lost everything by forgiving us when he saw that he says it does not compare yes I lost my mother yes I have 39 scars of a knife in my body but he also has scars in his see when you know Christ you have a reason not to hold on to unforgiveness because you feel guilty in front of a man whom you brought scars through your sin he found those attackers and he forgave them from the heart and he says I cannot choke you for four months of labor when my king forgave me 200,000 years of labor you know who that forgiveness set free not the jailer it set free the man who offered the forgiveness I read a story today about a young lady she went with her friends to a pool it was dark and the pool had no water and the friends thought the pool had water and that, like always they do they play and one of the friends pushed her into the pool and falling backwards she hid her skull into the bottom of the pool and right in the spot became completely paralyzed a young teenage girl when she got on a wheelchair and she lives on a wheelchair and she said I had to come to the terms I know it was an accident and I know I could question God but she said I cannot live emotionally on the wheelchair because Christ forgave me I also forgive today they're still friends and she still lives her life she says only my body is on a wheelchair he says everything else in my life is not I read about a green most of you know that killer green river killer who killed about 39 women and there was a one father who had a daughter and this man killed his daughter and this father actually came to Walla Walla and when they the, the, this man was there he, he had a meeting with him and when he met with him he told him this and these words really hit my heart he says there are people here that hate you I'm not one of them he said you've made it difficult for me to live up to what I believe and this is what God says for me to do it that I should forgive and he says sir you're forgiven a monster a murderer 49 people tears begin to roll down his eyes because that's exactly what Christ did to us he showed us the standard that is so high because the world we're living in is so broken the main two reasons for forgiveness is that Christ has offered us forgiveness as the second one if we don't Satan is waiting with his demons to rip our life into pieces Satan is waiting with demons of depression, with demons of suicide thoughts, with demons of promiscuity. Satan is waiting with demons of all kinds of arthritis and all kinds of back pain and all kinds of headaches and all kinds of nightmares. He's waiting with demons of cutting your veins. He's waiting with demons of drugs and alcohol. He's waiting with demons with same-sex attraction. He's waiting with all kinds of demons and say, please, please hold on to your reasons not to forgive. You don't understand. Christ doesn't understand. Your case is different. Nobody else will understand hold on to that because then you can give me a reason to hold on to you and Christ stretches his hand and says I forgave you when I was the one offended by you not only I forgave you I love you every single day I look at you and I'm not reminded of what you did I am reminded of how much I love you look at my scars I'll keep them for eternity to remind you how much I love you you haven't felt my presence for weeks it doesn't matter there are scars on my hands to prove that I love you good Friday service is to prove that I love you not what you feel during prayer not what you feel during worship not what you feel when you get a breakthrough not what you feel what happens in your life it's what happened on the Calvary determines how much he loves you and he says and I forgave you never once in my presence did I ever remind you of your past and now let go stop choking that person who owes you four months stop choking your dad because he wasn't there your mom because she divorced with your dad stop choking that uncle yes he touched you inappropriately it was wrong and it was bad you should call the authority get the restraining order but don't choke him let him go so Satan stops choking you the hardest person to forgive is yourself. It's 
it's easy to forgive others at times and the person that we have the most hardest time to forgive is ourselves. when Judas betrayed Jesus Satan came and said Judas what you did was unthinkable the man is dead you're the worst you're the scum of the earth you don't deserve to live what you did nobody else ever 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 has done and when Christ comes back he'll never forgive you and Satan pushed Judas and simply says your sin is too big commit suicide and Judas takes the rope and hangs when at the same time a man was hanging for Judas sin and Judah is hanging himself over his own sin don't punish yourself for a sin Jesus already paid for don't punish, don't hang yourself over something the Son of Man already hanged for you. Because no matter how much you're going to try to pay for your sin, it will never be enough. Only Christ's sacrifice is enough and is sufficient. Receive that forgiveness from Christ. Give yourself that forgiveness. The Bible says to forgive man. Sometimes that man is you. Forgive yourself. I always tell people, if you cannot forgive yourself, and God being holy can forgive you who do you think you are that you cannot forgive yourself you're not holier than God your standards are lower forgive yourself and when Satan comes to you and says you're such a terrible person you slept with so many people when Satan comes to you and says listen you got a DUI when Satan comes and tells you listen you've been broken you're a single mom your life will never make it. You, 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 you're a person with a salvage title. When Satan comes to you and begins to just make you, remind you of your past and relive those feelings and you look at yourself in the mirror, you say, you're right. I've done all of these things. But that's what the moment you have to turn away from what he says and go to the cross and remember that all of these things were paid for. Come back to the devil and say, Satan, since we've been talking about my past, let's open up a conversation and talk about your future because I've been through hell but I'm not going there again you are going to hell I've been through the worst I almost died but God pushed me through I was supposed to be gone a long time ago but God helped me through and yes I'm not proud of what I've done but that's behind me but Satan what's ahead of you is so much worse than what was behind me Christ died for me and he will punish you Christ rescued me but he won't move a finger to help you Satan on a white throne he's gonna put a crown on my head he's gonna call me his own he's gonna put a rope on me but he'll kick you out of that throne straight into hell with all of your demons so you want to remind me again about my future about my past Satan go ahead because I'll open book of Revelation last few chapters and I'll remind you where you headed. Your worst hell is still waiting for you. My worst hell ended. You better tell that to the devil. And you better stand your ground. Forgive yourself. And then you'll be able to be free to love other people. Have a higher self-esteem. Be better to other people. In Jesus' name. This week, some of you will need to send a letter to somebody who hurt you and forgive them. Some of you this week will need to make a phone call. Some of you this week, you will need to write a letter to yourself and forgive yourself. Some of you this week, you've been hiding a secret that has been draining life out of you, of the things that you've done and the longer you keep the secret, nobody knows but it's draining and you will need to come to someone you trust and simply say, this weighing me down. I need to bring it to the light and pray for me but the guilt and shame will be removed. Some of you this week, you will be healed because as you release forgiveness God releases healing as you release the rejection God releases grace some of you will see a change in your finances as you release the things you hold on to Satan loses the grip because the oil of the Holy Spirit comes on you the Holy Spirit wants to empower you and wants to help you don't wait for some people to ask for forgiveness you offer that before that Jesus was on the cross Pharisees wasn't asking for apology and the father at the moment rejected Jesus as it seems and Jesus says where are you where are you why have you forsaken me 
he didn't feel God's presence listen to this very carefully yet he still forgave man many people they are in a moment where they say I don't feel like God is near and God is close forgive then and not only that but he said father I yield my spirit to you and then he died you can never surrender your life fully to God until you surrender hate you have toward man away and only then the Holy Spirit said Jesus you didn't fight Pharisees you didn't try to prove anything to Pharisees you forgave them you surrendered your life to me let me punch them right in their teeth because on Sunday morning when it seemed like everything was over when the stamp and the best elite soldiers were guarding the tomb when disciples so weak that they ran from Jesus and hid like church mice somewhere in a hole the Holy Spirit said he oh Jesus gave me the power he surrendered his enemies to me and he surrendered his spirit to me and I am gonna go and make the biggest surprise and embarrassment to the Pharisees plans I'll embarrass the Roman Empire I'll embarrass everybody and I'll start from something small create a movement that every empire Nazism communism fascism atheism every other ism in the world will rise against this and nobody will be able to stop a movement that started from a man that forgave his enemies at the point of his pain started from a man who surrendered his life to the Holy Spirit and he raised him up you want God to raise your life surrender to him but you can't surrender to him until you first say forgive father for they don't know what they're doing